right, thank you. Um, there we go. All right, uh, my name is Stephanie DeVette. I'm an engineer at Pinterest, and I work on the home feed team there. What I want to talk about today is uh, what the Pinterest home feed is and how we blend content there. Um, so uh, the first question is what exactly is a home feed? Um, Pinterest uh, builds itself as a personalized catalog of ideas. And so our home feed uh, collects content from different sources, things the user follows, recommendations that we create, and it tries to build out a diverse set of all the things that our users are interested in. So I said we're a catalog of ideas. What does idea mean? Um, our unit of content is called a pin, and it is a visual bookmark that is saved from the internet by a user. And so this is a um, you know, a piece of content, basically. Um, and then to give you an idea of the scale, we have 150 million monthly users, and we serve about 10 billion of these pins a, a day, or 3 trillion every year. So I thought I would just walk you through how we build a home feed, because I'm not sure how many people here use our site. Um, so I created a test account, and first I followed a topic. I followed uh, Danish modern furniture. We have classifiers that actually uh, work to determine what content goes into which topic, and then we build out um, a feed based on content from all the users that post content about this. Uh, next, I followed some users. I have a friend who does nail art, and so I followed her, and I followed some of her friends. And as you can see, I built these slides around Halloween, and so they're very Halloween-based. Um, and third, I went to uh, search and I looked at imagery of beautiful oceans and I interacted with a bunch of it. Um, and so I didn't follow that, but our recommendations engine did pick up on it. And so I ended up with these images of beautiful oceanry in my recommendations. And then my final home feed looks like this. So it's a blend of all the things that I've told Pinterest I'm interested in. It's got nail art, it's got oceans, and it's got beautiful teak furniture. So. How exactly do we build this? Uh, we have content that's constantly being created and funneled towards a specific user. And what we do is when the content enters our system, we separate it out based on the type of content, uh, the different content sources, and then we send each content source to its own ranking model. So recommendations content goes to one ranking model, uh, content from your social connections would go to a different one. And then from these ranking models, we send the scored content to these locations we call pools. And these are holding areas that are score sorted and just contain content that was ranked by the same model. So not everyone uses this sort of model where they have separate rankers for different types of content. So why have we done this? Um, the reason is, first, this allows us to parallelize our model development. We have. Uh, found that we can have many more developers working um, totally uh, separately if we break things down in this direction. It also allows us to um, take into account the fact that these different types of content really have very different important features. If I have content that is um, from one of my social connections, the reason that that content is important to me is based on how close of a connection I have with this friend. Um, whereas if our recommendations engine is providing me content, it needs to be very closely aligned with my personal taste. Second, uh, or third, different content types might have different objective functions. So if I have uh, content that is about, um, you know, a recommendation, that's, that's supposed to be scored based on how engaging it is to the user. However, if I were to create, create a pool of content that were related to um, advertisement, for example, that content needs to be ordered uh, based on value to Pinterest instead. Uh, fourth, this makes it really easy to add new types of content. We have a team that's constantly producing new recommendations. And we found that at first when we were starting, when we were first starting to build ranking models, a lot of times the new types of content would not be modeled very well by the ranking model we had in place. And so the score distribution might be kind of off. It just didn't really work very well. And so we could add a new type of content. If necessary, we didn't even ha need to put a ranking model in place. We could just put that content into the system um, 
and then we didn't we could uh, introduce a ranking model later and we didn't have to compare it against other types of content. And finally, this just has worked very well in practice. We've been using this approach for about two years and we haven't ever felt like we needed a change. So now that we have these different pools of content, each of which is sorted by its own ranker, uh, the question is how are we gonna combine these results to get a final home feed? I think this problem is very generalizable, the idea of many different rankers whose results you need to, to combine in some way. And I want to kind of formalize it a bit, so uh, what are the constraints? The first constraint is that we need to maintain the way we rank each of the, the ranking from each pool. And of course that makes sense, we have a ranker, we should use it. Uh, second, scores aren't comparable between the different pools. And this is true because uh, the different ranking algorithm, different rankings pools might have different algorithms ranking them. They might have different score distributions. They're certainly not calibrated against any sort of ground truth. And so we really have no idea if a score of 0.8 from my social connections is better than a score of 0.9 from, um, from recommendations or not. Uh, also, like I said, we might not use a ranking model. And so we really just cannot compare scores. There are also some desired traits of a good solution. A solution that has a user, uh, or the first desired trait is we should use user history. And so if we have significant user history, um, those users should see more of the types of content that, that we know that they prefer. And the second desired trait is we should do a really good job of making new users uh, very tunable. Uh, products like ours, um, people tend to want to really, really do a good job of new user onboarding, and so there tend to be tons of experiments around really fine-tuning that experience, and we need to really make sure that that's possible. We also need to make sure that new users start out by seeing some of all of the different types of content, and that we can tune from there. And so that is the problem set up. So let's jump into like what sorts of models we want to build. Uh, when we first started building this feed, we simply used a fixed ratio model where we would take uh, three pieces of content, the top three highest scoring pieces of content from the social pool, and then the top seven highest pieces of content from recommendations, and repeat this over and over again. And this is functional, but it is not worthy of a talk at an all conf, and so that is not what I'm here to tell you about today. <laughs> um, so next you might think, well, why don't we just calibrate these ranking models against some ground truth, um, then you don't have to really think about this problem at all and you can use the ranking score. And that's a really good point. Um, and we found that for our stage of development, when we were first starting to work on this, it was a bad idea. The reason is we were just starting to build these ranking models. We were trying out different modeling techniques. We were constantly adding in new features. The score distributions were just like jumping all over the place every time we introduced a new model into production or ran a new experiment. And so there was really, um, it felt like if we introduced a calibration step, we would slow down our ranking team. Similarly, we really wanted to just separate out um, the blending component from the ranking component entirely so that those teams could work independently. And so that is why we decided not to try and calibrate the models against anything. I think this solution does work pretty well if you have a more mature ranking problem or ranking uh, result or it's for some teams, but for us, it didn't work very well. Or we didn't think it would. Um, so instead, we went with a multi-armed banded approach. So what we'll do is we'll use a multi-armed bandit to model the affinity of a user for each of the types of content. Um, and we will, so we'll have a different arm of the bandit will represent each of the types of content, um, each of the pools. So an arm for the friends pool, an arm for the recommendations pool. And once we've uh, built this bandit model, what we'll do is um, we'll sample, we'll use it to sample content. And in our system, system, we don't have a classical bandit problem because we're constantly, um, we don't get feedback after every sample. Instead, what we do is we need to create ten, like a thousand pieces of content, send them to the user, and wait and see what we get back. So what we decided to do 
was to use a Thompson sampling technique where we will uh, map the pool affinities, how much a user likes each of the pools, onto that integer ratio that I mentioned we were using originally. So now we're personalizing this, this integer ratio um, based on how the user likes the content. What data do we have? Um, like typical web problems, what we have is um, actions that indicate users have positive intent. We have actions that indicate the users have negative intent. Um, many types of actions uh, for each of these. We also just have the number of views that the user have taken on content. And uh, it's typical when you're building this sort of system that we will model affinity using a beta distribution. And so the beta distribution is good for binary processes where we have uh, uh, successes or failures. So a success is represented by the user taking an action on content, and a failure is represented by us showing the user a piece of content and then not taking an action. So we can model each of the actions using a beta distribution, each of the action types, excuse me. Um, but like I said, there are many different action types. And each of these action types has its own um, value to our system. So we can apply a different reward to each action, ty action type. And what we'll do is that um, we will uh, pull an arm of the bandit and we'll get back many responses on did the user take action type A, did the user take action type B, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can uh, make a linear combination of the responses, of each of these responses, and um, weighted by the rewards which looks like this. Um, so how are we doing? Uh, out of the goals that I mentioned earlier, uh, the model we have does at least half of what we needed to do. Um, but we haven't really talked at all about new users. So what do we need to do to make the new user situation really tunable and work really well? The answer to that is we um, for users who we don't have much data for, we want to really enforce that um, they see some of each of the types of content in the page. And we can do this by adding in additional prior actions and prior views. And what, this, what we would do for this is we would um, tune the action rates to exactly match the initial constant distri content distribution that we want. And then we can tune the number of views to say how how much we want that distribution to move. If we want it to um, be stable for a user's first few weeks, we can make that number larger. And so we end up with this formula for how we represent content. Um, and then when we get back to like how do we actually use this model, our sampling technique, can we can just take the expected value of the utility function and what we end up with is, because it's a beta distribution, it's really easy to compute. And uh, what we'll do is we'll map the expected values of the pool utilities onto an integer ratio. And uh, you see that there's a very simple formula now on the screen. So you might wonder, why did we go through all of this like complicated math? And the answer is that we now have a much more principled background uh, for what we're doing and also we now know a lot more about ways we can tune this problem in the future. If I had just kind of tried a bunch of different formulas and settled on this one, I would think that the way that I change this is by modifying um, one of these priors or one of these business values. I wouldn't think, oh, well, what I should do is I should change my sampling technique and I should change um, out the distribution that I use to represent um, a user's affinity for an action. Um, so having gone through this exercise gives us many more options for how to move forward. All right, so now we've handled new users as well. So let's look at some examples. So first, uh, let's just go with a positive action type and a negative action type. Um, positive actions get a positive reward. Negative actions get a negative reward. Um, and let's add in some prior values. Uh, a few positive actions and some number of views. And so for a user who has history in the past, um, this particular user has taken many positive actions on their friends pool and they really, 
they really uh, know what they want there. They have seen many pieces of content, were very clear that they um, have interacted positively with their friends pool. They've also taken many negative actions on their recommendations pool, so we're um, likely not doing a great job of recommending content to them. And we can draw out what the utility functions look like, or the utility distributions. We see that there's just one purple peak rec representing the positive actions. For the friends pool, for the recommendations pool, there is a peak for uh, positive actions and also a blue peak for negative actions, which represents um, something that will multiply by negative one to get the final result. And so when we take the expected value of these utility functions, we indeed find that the recommendations pool has a negative expected utility, so there's no reason we would ever want to show that because we know that the user doesn't like it. We also see that the, the friends content pool has a high expected utility, and so we end up showing mapping this to a ratio of 10 to 0. And what that looks like in practice is the user's feed would look like this, where all the content comes from their friends. Let's also look at a new user. Um, this user has taken two actions on each type of content. Uh, they have a total of 100 views on friends content and 10 views of recommendations. And so they just have not been around much. And what we end up seeing is that the utility functions are very strongly dominated by the prior, as you'd expect, and their expected utilities are very, very similar. And so we map this to a ratio by multiplying by 100 and rounding, and what we end up with is a ratio of 5 to 5, which means we show half the content from their friends pool and half from their recommendations pool. And so this is what the new user's feed looks like. All right. So we put this model into practice in our own systems. So let's see how it, how it went. Um, we found that we were able to increase the fraction of users who took a positive action. Um, so we were able to help some users who really weren't finding any content at all. We also increased the rate of positive actions taken on our viewed content. So we were able to um, show that, uh, to be more efficient with the content that we've showed to users. And finally, we really did personalize these ratios. So if you look in the control graph, there's a very sharp peak uh, where that is how many pins we showed to users that were from the social pool. And we've really spread that peak out across all of the different groups of users, um, showing that we've really figured out who likes what, who likes to see this content and who doesn't. So in conclusion, uh, this model was not an incredibly complicated uh, version of a multi-armed bandit, but it worked really, really well for us. And why was it successful? It was successful because it consisted almost entirely of tunable variables that were based on our business objectives. Um, we made it really easy to add new types of content, and we completely isolated what was going on in the content blending from what was going on in the ranking. And so those two teams could work independently, and they never felt like one of those teams was slowing the other one down or causing problems for the other team. And that is all I have to say. Thank you all very much for your time.